Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to our reading of The Hero of Kendrickstone. Chapter 2, The Road to Kendrickstone. Wake up! Your eyes flutter open to the bright lights of the morning sun streaming through the window. The light seems to wash over you, a radiant tide burning your eyes. As seconds pass, the light recedes and you see the dark, blurry outline of shapes and figures. The world around you solidifies into a concrete image. The last wipe, uh, You wipe the last vestiges of sleep from your eyes and regain your bearings. Looking around, you see... Hmm... Let's, let's go with the inn. We're a bard. It makes sense that we'd hang out at an inn that we're performing at. You haul yourself out of the narrow wooden cot to find yourself face to face with a short, potchy man in a stained but serviceable tunic. About time you got up, he says, a toothy smile coming easily to his lips. Then again, you're the one that told me you wake up extra early today. You nod. You did, didn't you? John, the pot-bellied man, turns to leave. If you need me, I'll be downstairs cleaning up, he says over his shoulder as he steps out of the room. You take a few moments to throw on your cloak and belt on your eating knife. Then you sling your lute across your back. It's hardly the most well-made instrument ever created. In fact, it seems sometimes one good knock from flying apart. Still, it has served you well, and its body has been polished smooth over long years of use. The lute, along with your singing voice and your way with words, paid for your in-room. It wasn't particularly comfortable life, but singing is something you enjoy, and you can tell a story like no other. You became well known to the village of Forester's Hollow, and some locals come to the Leaping Lion Inn every night to hear your voice. Still, that chapter of your life is done now. You take one last look around the cramped little upstairs room before stepping out into the hallway. Today, you are a village bard no longer. Today, you become an adventurer. You descend the stairs with your few worldly belongings and your loot slung on your back. As promised, you find the pot-bellied John in the large, high-ceilinged common room, the cavernous heart of the Leaping Lion. Broom in hand, he sweeps the ale-stained and bone-befouled rushes from last night into a pile, as his cadaverous thin wife, Kate, strews fresh ones on the swept earthen floor from a bag with her one good hand. Ooh, that was a long sentence. John stops and looks up as soon as he hears you coming down the stairs. So you're really going this time, eh, girl? You nod. Sorry to hear that, Isabel. Oh, it's Kate. Sorry to hear that, Isabel, Kate says. She stopped working as well. I wish you'd change your mind. It may not be silk sheets and roast beef every day here, but at least it's still warm, and Sir Cullum's sword sworn sword keeps us safe you nod again john and kate have hardly been unkind in your stay under their roof in fact you'd almost begin to think of them as family a life with them helping them run their little inn cleaning tables by day telling stories by night and singing ballads would not be a bad one still you know your path lies in another direction and as much as the leaping lion has become your home you want something greater Let's be a hero. We want to be a hero. Kate is right. It is safe and warm here, but you've never been one for safety and warmth when it meant you had to live by somebody else's rules. The owners of the Leaping Lion had been fair to you, true, but you don't want fairness. You want freedom, and you're willing to brave the cold nights and dangerous wilds if it means that you can live a life where nobody can give you orders, where you can roam the world righting wrongs and become a great hero like those of legend. You tell Kate and John as much, and both of them seem to accept your answers with as much grace as they can muster. For a moment, John stands there, shaking his head, but then Kate nudges him into the side with the wooden stump and ducks behind the counter. He emerges a moment later with a small leather pouch and a stout staff as thick as three of your fingers put together, and almost as tall as you are. John hands you both items. We don't want you to go, but if you're set on it, we want you to be safe. The roads are no longer a place for a young girl traveling unarmed, he says as he hands you the staff. That'll be a stout stick to knock that'll be a stout enough stick to knock the brains out of any thug who might tra trouble you. You take the staff in one arm. 
You take the staff in one hand and the pouch in the other. It clinks as you grab it, and you can feel its weight as it rests in your hand. There's, fif There's fifty silver pennies in there, Kate says. It'll be enough to get you to the great city and to give you a little to live off besides. You know the way, of course. You nod. In Forester's Hollow, the great city can only mean one place. Kendrickstone, a walled city of 15,000 inhabitants and one of the greatest centers of commerce in the Concordat. It is but two days' travel down the great road, a shining promise of opportunity for someone who has known only the mud huts and shabby stone castle of Forester's Hollow. You exchange your last goodbyes. The two innkeepers fold you along, fold you in a long, rough hug. Then, with a final wave, you turn away and walk through the doors of the Leaping Lion Inn, onto the dirt road, and your first steps as an adventurer. And look at that, an achievement. Leaving home. Hooray! Soon you find yourself walking east, down the wide earthen road to Kendrickstone. Even as the crisp, cool air of the early morning gives way to the heat of the noonday sun, the trees of the forest to each side of the road shade you from the warmth of the day. Thankfully, the last few days have been similarly clear and dry, which means that the road is firm under your feet. You know well enough that a single heavy rainfall can be enough to reduce a dirt road to a knee-deep mass of mud and slime. Such a quagmire would make traveling any substantial distance nearly impossible. Today, however, with the roads as solid as rock under your feet, you make good progress, pausing every few hours to rest your legs. For nearly the entire day, you walk on in solitude, the sounds of the forest and the occasional flitting bird your only companion. Therefore, it is almost a surprise when you hear the clip-clop of iron-shod iron horses. The rattle of wheels rises from the road ahead. Your body tenses as you ready to defend yourself. Who knows what kind of people might you might meet on the road. Soon, the source of the sound comes into view, a handful of riders leading four heavy-covered oxen-pulled wagons, a merchant caravan. You get a better look as the distance between you and the caravan slowly closes. The outriders are clearly ready for danger, clad in vests of boiled leather, swords and maces belted to their hips. A few others sit on the wagons, children mostly wearing sturdy, well-made tra traveling garb. As the head of the caravan, at the head of the caravan, are a man and woman, both mounted. You size them up as they approach. The woman is hard-faced and dangerous-looking, armed and armored in the same fashion as the outriders, with a wide-brimmed kettle helm on her head besides. The man is plump and red, a brush of bright red hair adorning his fleshy face. Hail, friend, the man shouts as you close within thirty paces of each other. How do you respond? I'll return his greeting. We're nice people. We're a bard. You wave back. Hail to you as well, you respond. The caravan guards seem to relax visibly as you do. Well met, girl, the man replies as he halts his caravan before you. We haven't seen a lot of traveler on these roads these past few days. The woman besides the caravan master keeps her distance. As far as you can tell, she's entirely preoccupied with scanning the road ahead of them for threats. Judging by her expression, she seems less than amused by their momentary stop. The caravan master extends his hand to you. I am Michael of Thornhall, and this is my caravan, and the door long young lady next to me is my associate, Hilde. You must excuse her. She thinks threats are everywhere. They are everywhere, the armed woman replies tartly. My comrades and I are merely taking precautions to keep you and your family safe. Let's ask what the carts are carrying. We picked up bundles of wool and pig iron from Kendrickstone, the caravan master replies easily. His, gu our, his guard's eyes narrow in suspicion. Why do, you, why do you want to know, she asks. You shrug. Just curious. Michael of Thornhall nods, seemingly satisfied with your answer. By the way she looks at you, Hilde seems somewhat less so but an exasperated glance from the caravan master forestalls any real objection for her. Uh, well, let's ask if the roads aren't safe, I guess. Not for a single person traveling... Oh. Not for a single person traveling alone, they aren't. 
Hilde states bluntly. I hope you know how to use that, she nods, nodding at the staff at your hands. Michael of Thornhall shakes his head. Surely it isn't bad as all that. This is the Duchy of Kendrickstone, not the Iron Marshes. Hilde shakes her head. Normally, I'd agree, but the guards did warn of a band of outlaws in these woods. I would plan on taking these warnings seriously. She turns back to you. I'd keep my eyes peeled if I were you. Well, I don't really care how much further it is. We've made, said two days, and we've traveled for about a day, so... Safe travels. The caravan master nods again, still smiling. Hi, and to you, friend. And with that, the whole caravan, guards and carts both, grinds and rattles into motion, resuming its ponderous progress past you as you continue on your own way down the earthen road. Within minutes, the caravan is nothing more than a cloud of dust, and the sound of iron-shod hooves fades behind you. Before you've gotten much farther, the sun reaches the horizon of the sky, and the sky begins to grow dark. This late in the day, mosquitoes come out in force, buzzing around you in thick black clouds, even as the darkness turns the veteran forest on each side of you into an ominous tangle of shadow. The sight of the large building comes up ahead, with brightly lit windows and smoke coming out its chimneys, is welcoming indeed. As you get closer and the sun finally dips under the horizon, you can see that the structure is a large, two-storied hall accompanied by a row of stables and surrounded by a head-high stone fence. Sounds of music and laughter spill out of the open windows, and a bright watch fire burns at the gate's fence next to a crudely painted wooden sign of an angry-looking figure, hung from an iron post on the gate post. The Growling Giant Inn, the sign says in bright red letters visible by the light of the watchfire. You make your way past the fence, through the courtyard, and into the main hall. The high-ceilinged common room of the Growling Giant Inn is bright and filled with the stink of urine, spilt ale, roasting meat, and burnt wood all of the aromas of human civilization. Maybe half the benches in the big room are empty. The rest are filled with merchants, caravan guards, and other travelers, each busy with their own amusements, whether food, drinking, dice, or song. You walk up behind it. You spent Behind it is a tall, burly innkeeper, idly polishing some of the dark fluid you've never seen before. You ask him for a bed for the night. In response, the innkeeper rattles off a long list of options and their associated costs, from expensive and luxurious to the downright squalid but cheap. How will you spend your night? Let's go comfortably. We don't need to be lavish, but uh, I don't like the idea of a common room. One step up. You sit yourself down to a supper of thick brown bread and a bowl of stewed game birds seasoned with a tiny dash of valuable black pepper. As you wash down your meal with a tankard of freshly brewed ale, you are shown to your room for the night. The room you paid for is admittedly a little cramped, but it has four walls, a roof, and a cot with a straw mattress, which is all you really wanted. Your night is quiet and restful, and you wake in the next morning refreshed and ready for the road ahead. After a small morning meal of brown bread, cheese, and ale, you're back on the road to Kendrickstone, your strength replaced, ready for another long day of travel. Nice. By noon, you can tell you're getting close to the city. In the distance, through the gaps in the trees, you catch the sight of smoke from a thousand chimneys. You pick up the pace, knowing that there is unlikely to be any more inns on the way to the great city. Finally, halfway through the afternoon, you see in the distance a tower of bright red stone, one of the spires of the Kendrickstone's keep. You squint your eyes and lean forward for a closer look which is why you don't realize you are alone in the forest until an arrow buries itself into the dirt road just a few paces ahead of you. Whoops. The foliage of the side of the road rustles, and out steps half a dozen men and women. Each is armed, each looks at you threateningly, and each is clad entirely in black. You doubt they are here to exchange pleasantries. One of the black clad men, raises an ash bow in one hand. No doubt he was the one that shot at you. He steps forward, expression malevolent. One lone child wandering the road when bandits are about? Foolish. 
very foolish. Your muscles, your muscles clench, your eyes widen, and you feel a bead of cold sweat trickle down your back. The black-clad archer, clearly the leader, pulls another arrow from his quiver and knocks it in his bowstring. Hand over your coin and weapons, girl, slowly. No sudden movements, or this next arrow goes through your heart. What will you do? Uh, I bet you I could stall him with words while I think of a plan. You know better than to show weakness in front of these thugs. If you let them know that you have the advantage, they'll no doubt press it, which could leave you robbed, beaten, or dead. Instead, you do the unexpected. You puff out your chest, widen your stance, step forward, and all but bellow in their faces. Who dares threaten me? Isabel the Mountain Breaker, Arch Wizard, and Slayer of the Dragon King as Karoth. Some of the bandits pause. One of them even steps back. Good, you have them off balance. Now to press your advantage. You! You point at one of the closer bandits, a woman in a heavy clad with a heavy blanded fa falchion in one hand. I think I shall flay you alive. Your skull will make a fine drinking cup. Amazingly enough, your target gulps visibly and takes a step back, her stance increasingly uneasy. It's amazing what a loud voice, the right body language, and a little confidence can do. I've got a grin ear to ear. This is hilarious. What are you doing, you idiots? The bandit archer snarls. Don't tell me you actually believe this stupid girl's lies. The visibly shaken bandit with the falchion takes another step back as you take it one forward. I don't know, boss. What if... The bandit archer cuts her off with a sneer. What if what? The girl is actually a wizard and a dragon slayer? Not lest that dragon was made of straw, you idiot. You take another step forward. But, boss, the bandit woman protests, I've heard that wizards can disguise themselves as children and the like. I'm not taking any chances. I don't want to be flayed alive. She seems almost panicked now. You can't well believe how well your bluff is working against her. Before you can say anything else, the bandit archer brings up his bow. With a smooth and practiced movement, he f puts a feathered shaft through the wavering henchman, henchwoman's arm. She stumbles back, her eyes wild as she fills the air with screams of agony, and crumples to the ground from pain and shock. The bandit archer draws another arrow. Anyone else feel like objecting? No? Good. He brings up his bow again, aiming directly at your heart. Now we'll see what happens to children who tell tall tales. Stop right there, criminal scum! The black-clad archer turns to the sound of the new voice almost by instinct. He looses his arrow, only to see what it bury itself in the painted oak stout of shield not paces, ten paces away. The shield's bearer is a tall, muscular figure covered in a full suit of steel mail and a heavy-set helm, glittering in the afternoon sun. The newcomer carries the sword and shield of a noble-born soldier, and wears the surcoat of a knight. Impossible, the archer growls, snarling voice suddenly jumping an octave. I shot you! I shot you right in the meddlesome heart! I killed you! The knight laughs, a low husky contrato echoing within her closed helm. Oh, it's a girl. Oh, well, I'm out of female voices. You tried to kill me, you stupid prat! The bandit scrambles backwards, hands shaking with panic as he tries to draw another arrow. The knight advances, slowly, deliberately. The archer looses, looses his shaft, only for it to once again embed itself in the armored woman's shield. The surviving bandits rush to the knight, and one of them lunges, a dagger held high. The mail-clad warrior barely breaks her stride. A subtle shift of her footing sends the charged bandit staggering past as she knocks him down with a contemptuous flick of her shield. Behind the hapless attacker, the others stop in their tracks. The knight's prowess has given them enough to pause for her advance on the bandit leader, who has dropped his bow and now holds a dagger before him like a talisman. The bandit who seemed so frightening just a moment ago has been reduced to a whimpering child. If you'd found me, if you'd found me in a happier mood, I'd advise you try to kill me harder next time. The knight jests, the dryness of her voice thick enough to be evident through her helm. Today, however, I'm going to make sure you won't ever try to kill anyone, ever again. 
The knight slams her shield into the bandit leader as if it were a giant oaken fist. The dagger drops from the archer's fingers, and the knight brings her blade down onto the bandit's head, cleaving bone, skin, and brain. A quick death. Holy shit. With a fluid kick, the armored warrior sends the archer's body tumbling to the ground. By the time it hits the florist floor, no one else is in sight. No one living, anyhow. With the bandits gone, the knight wipes her bloody sword on her surcoat and rushes towards you, still holding her shield up. Are you all right, girl? Have they hurt you? She demands as she sheathes her sword and puts down her shield. You shake your head. I'm all right, you reply. The knight gives you a suspicious look. Are you certain? I'll not have you die on me because you decided to hide a, wo hide a wound for the sake of foolishness, youthful pride. There's a pain in the knight's voice. She's speaking from personal experience. You are indeed still unhurt, however, and a moment's inspection, your armored savior seems to agree. The knight helps you up with one muscular hand. She shakes off her heavy, she takes off her heavy steel helm and padded coif and the other to reveal a strong-featured face barely touched by age, but heavily ravaged by the scars of battle. She offers you a polite bow as you find your feet, a short her short-cut mouse hair, mouse brown hair dangling in sweat-matted tangles around her head as she does. I have the on I have the honor to be the Dame Mildred of Son Mercy, a knight of Kendrickstone, she says, with a formality that seems to sit uncomfortably with her. Who might you be? Isabel, from Forester's Hollow, you reply. The knight nods. Well then, Isabel. My apologies for not... Ah, well met then, Isabel, and my apologies for not arriving sooner. You nod, though you can hardly see how the knight's arrival could have been any luckier. It would be best if we put some distance between us and this scene. Those bandits might return, and in greater numbers. What are they, sand people? The sand people always travel single file. They will be back. They startle easily, but they will be back, and in greater numbers. You take a look at the start short stretch of road and the corpse of the man who almost killed you, lying unmoving in a pool of his own blood and brains. Ooh, graphic, jeez. Getting away seemed like a really good idea. Getting away seems like a really good idea. However, the dead bandit leader isn't the only body there. Another bandit still lies wounded on the ground, pale and senseless, her fletchion next to her. Even a fool can see she will bleed to death before sunset. The question is, are you going to stop that from happening? Mm, yeah, we'll help her. Hold on, this woman needs our help, you declare to the knight, gesturing at your would-be enemy. That woman is a bandit, girl, Dame Mildred replies flatly. Are you sure that's a good idea? You look back at the ground, then back up. Does it matter? She'll die if we don't help her. Aren't knights supposed to help people who need it? Or does that simply apply to people wearing the same surcoat as you? You reply acidly. The knight hesitates, then nods. She tears another strip from her increasingly short surcoat and hands it to you. Do you, know, do you know how to bind this up? You nod. Broken limbs and other injuries were a constant risk in Forrester's Hollow that you find it hard to imagine anyone who doesn't know at least basic treatment. Within moments, you are finished. There. It is, uh, there, it is done, Mildred says as you stand back up. Now we need to get out of here. Yep, let's roll. After about 200 paces, you come to a tall, sleek warhorse, saddled, caparisoned, and tied to a tree at the side of the road. Dame Mildred gives the horse an affectionate pat and begins untying him. I suppose, she says, looking over at you, you were bound for Kendrickstone, I? You nod. Might I know why? The knight pulls the ropes free and begins coiling it up. Hmm. What to say? I'm looking to become an adventurer for hire. Sure, why not? Mildred's expression softens at the answer. Are you now? I did some of that myself in, as my youth as a knight errant. Slain monsters, helping dashing young lords stuck in towers, the like. <laughs> dashing young lords in there? I guess, whatever. 
There's a sense of fulfillment in doing the good like that, but the pay is irregular, the food is generally awful, and a warm bed is damn scarce. The knight continues to talk as she prepares her horse for travel. If you're looking for a way with food and a bed between jobs, I'd be happy to take you on as my squire. It's hard work, but it's honest and it comes with a clean bed and hot food. What say you? You think it over. Steady meals and a warm bed do sound good, but tying yourself to a mistress, no matter how generous, might prove restrictive. So, she demands as, you check, as she checks over her saddle harness, what say you? I have to decline. I'm sorry. The knight frowns, but nods. I see. Well, if you change your mind, go to the keep of the Kendrickstone city and ask for me. I'll have you enrolled in my retinue. Finally, the Dame Miltress finishes her prepare, Mildred pr finishes her preparations. She places her foot in the stirrup, and with a single fluid motion, swings herself into the saddle. She brings her horse about, back to the distant blood-red spires of the Kendrickstone, of Kendrickstone. She looks down at you from the saddle. If you'd like, I'd escort you to the city gates. It won't be much trouble for me. Part of my duty is to keep travelers safe, after all. Ah, I'd like that. You're a nice lady, Mildred. The two of you set off towards the distant gates of Kendrickstone. Dame Mildred mounted on her horse, and you on foot. The first few minutes pass in silence, as you mull over the events of the day. Soon, however, the silence seems to be oppressive. You look over as your escort as she rides beside you, reins in one hand, great helm carried under the other arm. She seems unlikely to strike up another conversation, but perhaps you have some questions for her? Ah, yeah, of course, why not? Excuse me, Mildred, could I ask some questions? The knight looks down at you. It's only then that you notice she seems to be as bored as you. Go ahead, ask away. Hmm... Let's ask where she's from. Me? The knight companion seems caught off guard by the question. I was born in Samercy. My mother is baroness there. You can't say you're surprised by her rank. Most knights are noble birth, after all. However, despite your life in Forester's Hollow, you must confess to the knight that you've never heard of Son... Son of Mercy. It's a fortress that guards the mar marches between the duty of Kendrickstone and Coraladis to the south, Mildred explains. It's maybe a day's ride to the south of the city. I was raised and became a page there, before I was sent to Kendrickstone to squire for one of the duke's knights. The knight leans back in her saddle, her exp expression wistful. I won my spurs at attorney in Tornhall, and I spent a few years riding around the Concordat as a knight errant. When I came back to the city, I took service as one of the Duke's knights, and I've been here ever since. What's it like being a knight? Actually, she replies, it's a lot like being an adventurer or a hunter, really. You look up at your mounted companion. What do you mean by that? Well, you spend long hours every day preparing for that split second danger when your skills and ability to respond makes the difference between life or death. It's not for the weak of spirit, I can tell you that. I never thought of that, you shake your head in wonder. And knights have to stick to a code of honor, right? Dame Mildred nods. Aye, that's true. Obey your liege, defend his people, follow him to war. Still, I rather prefer it. A knight's code isn't much of a burden for me, and I don't mind giving up a little bit of freedom I wasn't using in exchange for a steaming roast and a cold tankard of ale waiting for me at the keep every day after I come back from what I'll probably be doing as a knight-errant anyways. The knight looks down at you from her higher perch. I mean, freedom's all well and good, but what good is it if you're cold, wet, and hungry? Am I right? Hmm. I think we'd rather... Let's go full-on American. I think we'd rather be cold and wet. The knight shrugs, her expression carefully neutral. Aye, that's what I expected from a girl your age. I wonder if you'll be of the same mind once you see a bit more of the world. Are the roads usually this unsafe? Are we going to have to worry about it every time we travel? Dame Mildred shakes her head. With all that armor she's wearing, even that simple movement sounds like a collapsing pot shot. 
Normally, the roads are much safer than this. Road patrol is usually a job we give our squires to get them used to rough living. This year, though, the knight looks down at you, her expression tinged with worry. We've had more bandit attacks in the past season than the entire year before. All of the sci survivors say the same thing. Brigands in black who take no prisoners. That's why we've got full knights doing, like me, riding the roads. Uh, did that bandit really try and shoot you through the heart? It seems like a stupid question, really. Indeed, for a second, Dame Mildred looks at you as if you were some kind of idiot. See... <laughs> Seeing as how I'm still up and breathing, I'm pretty sure he didn't. She looks down for a moment. Admittedly, he did aim an arrow for my heart when he ambushed me, and it did fly true. Alright, now you're curious. If the arrow hit you, how did you survive? The mounted knight extends her arm towards you and shakes it, letting the fine steel links of her mail halberd, rattle and catch the afternoon sun. Armor, girl. If you're planning on facing more danger in the future, I'd suggest getting yourself some. It may be expensive, but it'll keep all your blood and guts where you should be. And with that, we are wrapping up our questions, I guess. The knight merely nods in reply. The two of you continue on your way. You and Dame Mildred continue your journey to the gates, city gates in silence as the afternoon turns into evening. The sun is low in the sky when the two of you finally leave the forest and find yourself a few hundred paces from the imposing stones, stone gates of the city of Kendrickstone. Your journey is over, for now. Well, with that little bit of eventfulness, I think I'll call this a part. Next time, Rogues and Wizards. Later, guys. <laughs>